Bonjour. So usually I'm uh, either too fast, too long, or too loud. So hopefully this time will be uh, will be good. Um, yeah. So today I would like to uh, to talk to you about the discovery that we've made and that um, we 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 think changes our conception of early arthropod uh, evolution quite profoundly and uh, that illustrates some of the earliest body plants in mandibulates, which is the most diverse and abundant group of animals. Um, this is, of course, very simplified, but uh, th this has been uh, a long debated issue, the relationship between, uh, amongst extant arthropods, but um, uh, molecular and, and morphological studies now converge to find two main clades, one called the mandibulata with the mandible bearing arthropods and another the chelicerata with the chelicerae uh, bearing arthropods. And uh, the problem is in spite of this uh, congruence now in, in, um, uh, with the extant material uh, and despite the fact that we have an abundant fossil record of arthropods in the Phanerozoic and especially in the, in the Paleozoic, um, the origin of the body plants remain quite problematic, poorly, if at all documented. And there, there, there's a lot of fossils, for instance, we can think about Xyphrosurans. They can already play, be placed in the crown groups. But for the origin of the body plants, we still lack evidence and, uh, for instance, we hardly can tell what the first mandibulates looked like. Instead, a lot of the Berger shell type, um, a lot of the fossils from the Berger shell type deposits in the Cameron uh, have been placed in the stem to both of these clades. And those groups include the trilobitomorphs, uh, the megacarans, which have been presented by Carolyn Ogg earlier as um, er, er, early chelicerates, I would say this is indeed controversial. In recent phylogenies, they have been rather uh, found as um, a stem to both of these clades. And those so called bivalve arthropods. Um, and so, interestingly, these bivalve arthropods, since they were first described by Wallacott, um, and even later when they were, were described by Derek Briggs and Whittington, they have been uh, compared to crustaceans, and they were thought to be related to crustaceans, but most recent authors uh, recently have placed them much more basally in the tree of true arthropods. Uh, yet, uh, most of their cephalic head anatomy has remained unknown so far. Um, this is a uh, you know, picture from from uh, Marble Canyon. So this is a site that we discovered in 2012 um, and that has yielded new species and new genera 40 kilometers away from the original site of the Burgess Shell. That's called Marble Canyon. Um, that has yielded uh, spectacularly preserved specimens. And you can see here uh, the view from the site and uh, yeah, Joe Moisuk and Robert Gaines looking very studious. And uh, Jean Bernard and myself with our, with our favorite jackhammer here. Um, and this is one of the slabs that we, you, you can find in Marble Canyon, typical slab. Uh, you have here a largely young collie that, uh, that's called Yawunik. And you have those two, um, those two specimens here with two large valves. They're also quite large. Um, and here you have, a, yeah, you have a trace of a jackhammer here. Usually it goes through the fossil. Um, so, yeah, this is the general aspect of this bivalve animal. For some, of, for some of you, it will remind of Brangiocaris. We'll talk about that later. Um, so you can see there's two valves. Yeah, multi-segmented body, Codorami, exopods here, and those very large claws at the front here. So those claws are very specialized. They're, the, the first piece ends in, in two claws here. This one is recurved. And here I use, and there's a peduncle that I call manus. And uh, for, some, for some people that are familiar with this terminology, it's a terminology that we usually use for crustaceans. 
And there's a reason for that, for the reason that I'm using that is because we think this is a max lipid and you will see why. Um, so this is an important specimen preserved in lateral aspect and what's fantastic about this specimen is that the left valve is still preserved on top of the appendages, which means that if you prepare this specimen, you can reveal the appendages underneath and you can count them. And this is very important, of course, to, to uh, understand the, uh, the anatomy. And you can see a big difference be between the posterior exopods, which are broad and flap-like, and the, the, those strong features here, which are very well-developed endopods at the front. And you can see here, those endopods are very stout, very well-developed, and distally they have uh, two pairs of uh, also well-developed claws. This beautiful specimen, you can see again the flop-like uh, exopods uh, posteriorly, and you can see some features here at the front. You can see again the, the kill of the maxillipede. You can see the antennules and this strange structure here, anteriormost, which is triangular. And this is another view here, and this is a structure that is anteriormost, and we find that in this new species, it is right in front of the mouth. And there are other features that has been found in, in, in discussed in bivalve arthropods, such as in, in Odoraya, they've been interpreted as anterior sclerites. And indeed, you also have a sclerite, which is not shown here. This is just a structure that's underneath the sclerite. Because of the shape in, in, uh, in modern arthropods, uh, what we call the labrum is either fleshy or sclerotized or both but it has the same topological position just in front of the mouth, and that's why we interpret this as a labrum. Uh, this is a, an important specimen preserved ventrally, and there are three critical features I would like to draw your attention on uh, in this specimen. The first uh, is a uh, fully preserved the trunk limb here. You have some endites here, and you have some interesting gnathal pieces here at the front. So if you look at this limb, you have uh, a seven-segmented endopod. You cannot see the last apodomeres here. And you have a basipod, which is, already, which is also subdivided and also segmented, and which bears uh, those rounded and spinose endites. And if you look at the front, you have this very striking piece here, uh, rounded, that is much larger than the other endites. Uh, is not attached to any sp specific branch. And you can see here what is a masticatory margin with a, with a tooth here. And because of the position, the political position of this structure, because of its shape, because it's not attached to any, any very large branch, there's only one conclusion that we can arrive to is that this is a mandible. And it's followed by two other relatively large pieces that we attribute to maxill and maxilla. And this is the reconstruction that we've made of the animal drawing by uh, Daniel Dufo. And so we have here the labrum, we have the antennule, we have uh, the mandible in between there, it's hidden. You have maxillum, maxilla, and maxillipede. Um, and what the implication of this reconstruction? If this is the, the antennule, and we, and we think this is the antennule, we think this is the frontalmost appendage. If the mandible follows directly the antennule, and, and if the mandible is homologous to the mandible of other mandibulates, this means that, like exapods and myriapods, this animal, this animal must have had an intercalary segment, which is normally a developmental segment lost in the adult that's only found in terrestrial arthropods. Uh, and this is a 3D reconstruction by Lars Field. And this new species also allows us to see the iconic branchial caries in a new light. And you have a specimen here from uh, the USNM on the right. You have a specimen from uh, uh, Utah here on the left. And this specimen from Utah are re really showing exceptional mandibles. Uh, the mandibles in Brancocaris are larger than the species in Marble Canyon. They're very well preserved in those specimens. You have traces of maxilla maxilla again here. And you have those very well-defined masticatory margins. And they're so well preserved that if you zoom 
on those masticatory margins, you can even see traces of striations on those margins, like you can, see, you can see in some manipulates today. And so, phylogenetically speaking, we find that uh, uh, this new species, along with Brancocaris, fall at the base of mandibulates, along with Canadaspis and Odoraya. And indeed, Canadaspis and Odoraya, although their head remains uh, unclear, their head configuration, uh, they share the same type of trunk limb morphology. And this is uh, Canadaspis here, this is Odoraya. Uh, and they all have a seven-segmented endopod, and they have a subdivided basipod. And at least in Canadaspis, this basipod also bears endites. And so those multi-endotic basipods, uh, they are known in the extent. They are known in, um, in crustaceans, and in, in, uh, especially in larval crustaceans. Um, and they also, they've also been described in Crustacea morflavi from the Orsian deposit. Um, and how much time is that? Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip to this. Um, I said it was going to be something. Um, so, yeah, so the evidence that this new species brings. Uh, with a multi endotic uh, basipod actually confirms the hypothesis that this morphology of a limb with a seven segmented endopod and a multi segmented basipod is a plesiomorphic condition in, uh, in uh, mandibulates, and that as a load for the development of the mandible and all coxal and precoxal elements, which is very different from what we have in trilobitomorph and limulate, where the gnathobase is made up of the um, the basipod. And so there are other further implications of this, and one of them is that fusionoids and eutycarcinoids in our phylogeny are also moved to the base of the mandibulate clade. And this is consistent with neural evidence found, for instance, in fusionuia, that fusionoids should be mandibulate alpha pot. And I thank you. Thank you.